sometimes the deck is stacked against you in the military. Um, and so let's talk about your take on the quote unquote unfair military system. Um, you know, maybe two or three points on, you know, how the deck is stacked against the person that they're, that is being accused. That's right. I think the first thing is everyone's on payroll, right? And what I mean by that is they're all, they're all taking the paycheck from Uncle Sam. And so you have the you have law enforcement, right? And they're all in the military and they're all looking for the next promotion or whatever it happens to be. And they're not looking to find you innocent. They're just not. NCIS, CID, OSI, they suspect you of a crime. They don't suspect you of being innocent, right? So they're, that's the first issue. They are looking to try to build a case against you so they can show that they're tough on crime so that the garrison commander or the base commander can say, look how great of a job my law enforcement's doing. And so they can get promoted and move up the ranks as well. So there's a, a very, very biased law enforcement, but much more so than I see even with uh, on the federal side or the state side, they're much more biased. And so there's this, um, there's this belief that all the time that if, if an allegation is made that they've committed an offense. First off, right there. The second piece of it is at the next level, if once an allegation gets briefed up, it's a command driven system, right? And so the command now says, well, I've got this allegation that CID or OSI or NCS has founded or found probable cause on. I need to now show that I'm, I'm tough on crime and good order and discipline, right? Because good order and discipline is really the keystone of the military. And you know, if, if a company commander has a problem that they don't resolve quickly, then are they going to get command again? How is that going to look to the, you know, battalion commander, the brigade commander? And that's at every level up. So you have company commander, battalion commander, brigade commander, all the way up to the commanding general, the convening authority. All of them are looking for a promotion. Every single one of them. A one-star wants to be a two-star. A three-star wants to be a four-star. And a four-star doesn't want to uh, testify in front of Congress, right? All the way down. And so there's this huge pressure to show that we're tough on crime. And it's not even the tough on crime very you know, very Ronald Reagan-esque, it's good order and discipline. It's that if you have issues with, you know, allegations of sexual assault, BH fraud, um, fights, you know, fights, good order and discipline, whatever it is, you are looked at as a poor company commander or a poor commander. And so you want to be able to show that you're tough on that. Look at me, I'm tough. It's like, it, it's an ego thing too, is for, for whoever is doing ac accusations. It is, and it's messaging, right? So, let, so let's say, because you know how much of a pain it is, if a commander has six sharp allegations in this unit, sharp is just the Army's or the military's sexual assault prevention program, right? They call it sharp, it's Article 120, uh, or Sapper and some of the other services. Well, if there are six allegations that are in his unit, they're gonna say, that's a command problem. And he might get investigated because he's not taking the program seriously enough, right? So he's going to try to stamp it out by saying, I'm prosecuting all of these. And even if one looks like it's not a very strong case, they're going to they're gonna send a message. And what they often hear is, well, let the courts figure it out. If they get acquitted, they get acquitted. So there's pressure there. Now, let's look at the JAG side as well, because they're not civilian prosecutors here. And they're JAG prosecutors. So the, who are the prosecutors? Young captains, oftentimes, who are supervised by a major, who are there, and they're supervised by a lieutenant colonel or a colonel. And so... If you keep getting, if these commands that you're advising really have all of these problems and you're not prosecuting them, you're looked at as a failed prosecutor. And so you're in the JAG office and you're what's called a trial counsel. And let's say you go through two years in a busy jurisdiction and you don't have any trials. People are going to wonder, what the hell were you doing? Because you want your fit reps and your OERs to reflect that you're a great trial lawyer. You're this great prosecutor. You, you know, you, you prosecuted 32 cases in a two-year period with un unmatched results, right? And it's like a bullet point in an OER fit rep I can write off the top of my head. And so these prosecutors aren't looking at it. I mean, some are, but the majority aren't. I mean, there are some good ones out there, but most of the good ones get the hell out of the military. Um, they do. And so you have these issues at even the higher leadership level. So you have the majors, the lieutenant colonels, the colonels pressuring these prosecutors to prosecute cases, they're advising commands to prosecute. And then you have this win at all cost mentality. So what happens is you have, let's say you have a false allegation. And so which maybe Tampa Police Department or Honolulu Police Department or wherever you're at would look at and say, well, clearly a false accusation, move on. Now the military picks it up and it sets this series of events in motion where now a service member is stuck for a year potentially, where they're flagged, they're on legal hold, they, you know, they lose their, you know, at least they get their security clearance, they may not revoke, but they initially lose their clearance, they don't have a job, they can't work at the SCIF, whatever it happens to be, and so their life's on hold. A year later, now we want to charge him, and now the 
the deck kind of gets stacked against him, right? And, and then, so we, and we wonder why a service member walks into the trial defense service office and sees their lawyer as a captain and has distrust. And this may be a, a very, very good attorney, um, but there's an immediate distrust because they're all on payroll, right? Everyone is. And then, then within the defense service office, again, there's a part of those lawyers, and I, I, I can't give a percentage or otherwise, you have to judge that for yourselves, who are thinking, I'm in this bill for 18 months, and the same people I'm going up against may be my supervisor in the next bill that I have. And it's very incestuous in that regard, right? And so just the way the UCMJ is structured leads it to be a very difficult process. It is a system designed to really ensure good order and discipline to get convictions. And you can't coexist with a system that's out to get you. You just can't coexist with them. And that's where the Civilian Defense Council, that's where this really plays in because I don't coexist in that system. You know, another attorney, you know, I'm thinking another, another attorney that does this, Mike Waddington, he's down in Miami. Mike's a, a, a brilliant attorney. Um, you know, he was a mentor to me. He doesn't coexist in that system. So if you got a guy like myself, you have someone like Mike Waddington, um, there are, are a lot of good civilian attorneys out there. I, you know, we don't play in that game. We're looking at getting it right, getting justice, ensure our client gets a fair shot at this and going in and winning and getting the hell out of there, right? Which is why, again, you probably don't want the local attorney there. You want someone that's outside. And so that on a macro level really shows how how biased the system is against the accused. Now, we can talk for days and run a whole series about all the micro levels about in terms of witness selection, your, the, how the jury how the jury or the panel is selected. For example, the panel of your jury is selected by the convening authority, the same person that's trying to charge you. So you wonder why, and, and you don't have a uh, unanimous verdict. So you go to trial, your jury's picked by the person that's trying to kick you out. And you have maybe two people on the panel that think you didn't do it. You're still going to prison. So go figure that out, right? And so there's so many things along the lines. I can walk you step by step by step. You know, I, I can really do an entire series with you how each step of the trial is designed to get a conviction, to ensure order, order and discipline. And you've got to be able to fight that at each and every step of the way. And if you don't know how to, either just by doing it and having the experience, knowing what works and what doesn't, and not having to worry about, Colonel Smith getting upset with you, then you're going to have some real problems at, at every step of the way. And that's, at least in my opinion, why I think the military conviction rate is so high, even though they take a lot of garbage cases to trial, but yet their conviction record is still very high. And I think that's, if we start deep diving that, there's reason for that. That's not just by happenstance.